Hello and welcome to episode 102 of the Market Maker podcast. And Piers, I can see you're joining me from a different location. It's either Shoreditch in London or <laughs> New York City. Where are you? Uh, New York City, baby. Uh, yeah, landed. Well, landed yesterday. Yeah, in the Big Apple. Um, Is this business or pleasure? Business, yeah, a couple of couple of big things going on actually. Just so I've got a big um, big event I'm running for Citadel tomorrow. Well, tonight and tomorrow, a bit of a networking session tonight. Um, I think it's 130 students that they've sort of um, selected from universities all over the US, uh, and they're coming up to New York and a bit of an event tonight. And then, yeah, we we're taking them through our market making and uh, quant trading simulation tomorrow. So, yeah. And then I got a bit of time for Sunday. I got working Saturday, but Sunday free. But then next uh, week, I've got a big Morgan Stanley uh, simulation going on on, on Tuesday. Um, yeah. So hitting some uh, some big clients, but then, you know, sightseeing on sunday maybe I had a little stroll at my hotel just around the corner from central park actually just a couple of blocks away okay. um so yeah get a bit of tourist action in somewhere okay well you know when i'm in the midlands next week i'll um <laughs> you know not downplaying yeah. the uh the quality of the midlands in the uk but yeah we should um <laughs> yeah that's true actually i get new york you get birmingham <laughs> <laughs> yeah nothing wrong with that <laughs> right so on the agenda for this week then want to talk about a um, couple of things going to blend a bit of a, a single stock story and a bit of education around how some financial institutions structurally are different from others because i know that's important particularly for students who are applying to these firms to understand that unique difference between investment banks so not even going as far as what's the difference between sell side buy side what is the actual difference between investment banks themselves yeah. like goldman's to jp to ms and others so we'll, we'll touch a little bit on that and then we'll talk macro because this week we've had um, usq4 second reading of gdp we've had the fed's preferred inflation figures pce and we've also had the latest FOMC minutes. So want to get your take on those events and see whether or not that's shifted the view on markets at all going forward. So starting off, JP Morgan, they could have exclusive access to the VIP club, the $1 trillion club, which is normally yes. reserved only for tech. Big tech. People, <laughs> tech firms. Who's, it, who's in that $1 trillion club at the moment? It's... Uh... Well, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Tesla briefly, didn't they? I think yep. flirted with it and then obviously it got chopped back. Um, what about Facebook? They're not, are they in it anymore? Actually, not mm, sure. No, not. They've no. also been hammered over the last sort of 12 months. But So the idea here is then that JP Morgan could become part of that club and you know, from a very top level perspective, kind of make sense with tech, or perhaps you could explain that. Why are the tech valuations so wildly different to a bank, for example, from a, from a sector equity perspective? Uh, one word, growth. Or I should say maybe two words, growth potential. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, be so careful these, there. <laughs> these tech firms, you know, are growing... Yeah, they're, they're top and bottom line growth rates. So their revenue growth rates and their profit growth rates are way higher, way faster than, you know, most other sectors and, you know, banks certainly. Um, and so that, that rap, more rapid growth rate is why you get higher valuations because you're seeing some of that future growth being priced into the market cap today. And then being cut back because interest rates are rising. Right, exactly. So, you know, 2022 um, was definitely the interest rate sensitive sectors. So, and certainly tech are right up there, top, probably top of that list. 
um, they've been hurt the most in terms of their share prices dropping in 2022 as share as as interest rates have risen. And yeah, one so one of the angles about that future growth, right, being embedded in today's share price, um, well, the value of that future growth has been discounted because of inflation and higher interest rates. And so, if if you like, the value of that future money it has dropped is is now less valuable today. Um, and that's why share prices come down in, in those interest rate sensitive stocks. Yeah. So before I um, talk about the one trillion, I must put the caveat on. They are expecting that to potentially happen quite a way <laughs> off. I think it was 2030, actually, where they think that J, JP could hit that milestone. I think their current market cap is something like the 400 billion. Four, 411. Okay. Yeah, so around that kind of level gives you an idea. Yeah. Um, I mean, I yeah, think... Th- go, on, go ahead. This is like... So this was a headline earlier in the week, right? And like all good headlines, um, they get attention and they get clicked on. And, and this was um, in, in true classic sort of equity research um, style. You know, as a person, if you're an equity research analyst... Um, then, you know, you want to become known, right? Your profile, you want it to, you want you want potential customers to be obviously aware of your work and what you're doing. And one way of of, of kind of increasing your 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 awareness out there is by yeah, generating big headlines and people clicking on them and then reading your stuff. So this actually came from a Morgan Stanley, ironically came from a Morgan Stanley uh, equity analyst who came out with this piece. So they obviously cover the banking sector, US big, US large cap uh, financial sector is Grazek. That's the name of this um, Morgan Stanley equity research analyst, Betsy Grazek. Um, and so she put this piece out and it had the headline, yeah, JP Morgan um, to, to whatever I can't, the exact headline but to join the one trillion dollar club um yeah when you when you kind of delve into it it's it's she's very bullish obviously um 411 billion is the market cap today and so she's saying it's going to more than double but yeah her caveat is not until 2030 so we've got seven years to go um she should she does say well actually no sorry She said, actually, her central theme, apologies, was that it would reach a trillion bucks in 12 years time. But then her range is the earliest it might happen is by 2030. But her base case is 12 years. So 2035. I mean, that's a hell of a long time. And, you know, trying to make predictions that are 12 years into the future um, are, yeah, I'm not sure there's too much merit that that should be placed on this kind of ultra long term forecasting. But um, her key central theme, as opposed to those tech stocks, which are interest rate sensitive, um, it's the banking sector that's the exact opposite. So banks are one of the few sort of companies that actually benefit from interest rates going up. And so her kind of whole thesis is about interest rates will stay high for longer. And so this will feed into, you know, much better um, net interest income revenues uh, for these big giant banks. Yeah, I was just having a look at a bit of a breakdown of the different revenue streams for some of these investment banks. And just to give you some context of numbers, I was looking at the... Goldman Global Banking and Markets. So Goldman's been streamlined into three divisions in this current restructuring they've been going through. So there's Global Banking and Markets. So this is kind of your trading and your IBD type packaged into one unit. Then you've got asset and wealth management. Then you've got platform solutions. Now, when you combine... So when you think of Goldman, you think, yeah, they're the, the leader in IBD... They do all the deals, obviously trading, securities, cross different derivatives. So they generate about six and a half billion, or they did in their last quarter 
uh, in terms of the earnings statement. So six and a half billion US dollars. If you bolt in asset and wealth management, it takes up to 3.6 billion. So you're talking around 10 combined. Right. Yeah. Now, when you look at JP Morgan, so not only is their corporate investment bank already bigger than that, just by a whisker, just short yeah. of 11 billion, their consumer and community banking area. I think if I said to most students, do you fancy working in consumer and community banking? <laughs> um, or do you want to work at Goldman's? Um, <laughs> but that consumer and community banking revenue is far greater than the entire pool of revenue across the, in all of the divisions of Goldman's. It clocks yeah. in just shy of 16 billion. Um, quite incredible. Yeah. And JP Morgan is the biggest bank. I mean, I'm actually not sure what the valuation of Goldman's is, um, but it's certainly no. I, I know, you know, th there's, yeah, th there's kind of, I guess the Goldman's and the Morgan Stanleys are a little bit more niche, even though they've been trying to broaden out and diversify and try and get into the kind of commercial banking gig. But but broadly, you would say that they're quite they're more niche, where it's more about global markets and, and IBD. But then when you think about big banks like J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, you know, they are giants of the commercial and retail banking world. And so J.P. Morgan's business, as you're saying there, like half of it, uh, more than half of it, I believe, or about, yeah, more than half of that, well, about half is, is from consumer and community banking. And that's their kind of big, big kind of um, underlying engine. And that engine is firing into life. Um, that engine's been a little bit squeezed for a decade because interest rates have been at zero. And now the interest rates have elevated pretty sharply. This, this big engine that they've got is really firing. And so why does that happen? Because the whole point around consumer and sort of corporate banking, it's how do banks make money? It's about um, borrowing money on the short term by getting individuals to deposit their salaries and their whatever other income they've got coming in and deposit your money at the bank. And then the bank pools all those deposits and lends that money out to their well, other individuals through things like mortgages, but other corporations and so on. Okay. <clears throat> and we talk about something called the net interest income. So that's just the difference between the amount they're paying to depositors. So what's the interest rate on deposits um, versus the amount they're earning when they lend the money out? And that gap, the spread between the two. So the interest they pay on deposits is, is really low. And the interest they, they charge on loans is, is much higher. And as interest rates re rise, that spread between those two can increase. And this is why, therefore, the revenues um, and, and in the end, the profits that come from that part of the bank um, ha have risen sharply. So 2022 has been a really good year for these big banks that have the giant, you know, underlying consumer and corporate banking divisions. It's something Goldman's have been desperately trying to break into um, and have spent a fortune trying to do it over the last, well, you'd probably say 10 years, but especially over the last five years. And yeah, this was one of the revelations um, a few weeks back when Goldman's had their earnings and their earnings were shocking. And it was the owning up, it was the fessing up that our strategy, trying to break this commercial banking market, our strategy has been terrible and it's failed. And we've spent a whole load of money and we've not got very far. And so that's why Goldman's, who have been trying to build that that kind of same similar kind of engine that JP Morgan have, um, haven't quite yet managed to figure it out. Yeah, I, I think I remember reading an FT newsletter and they were talking about if you're an investor, it's not about trying to pick the best bank. It's about diversifying which banks you are invested in. And so it's not like you're trying to bet on Goldman's will be able to diversify and mitigate the volatility on the dependency of fee generated business which as we saw is quite susceptible to economic and macro conditions it was no they will outperform like we saw with record-breaking fees during the initial onset of the pandemic yeah 
and through 21. And then the other banks will pick up and, and, and balance, counterbalance that in the current situation where we're at at the moment in a potential slowdown environment. Yeah. And you could say that JP Morgan's a one-stop shop, right? For an investor who you're, you're looking to get exposure across the sort of banking mm. elements and divisions, you could say that JP Morgan's one of those ones that has, has it all, right? In that it's got the big consumer banking arm. It's got massive um, investment banking arm. It's got a big asset management division. Um, so it's, yeah, as a business, it's much more diversified than banks like Goldman's, which makes it a safer investment. And, and that's why the JP Morgan share price is a lot less volatile. And back to this analyst at Morgan Stanley, um, Grasek, and she's saying that, yes, so her thesis is based off the idea that there'll be a soft landing. And so the Fed will carry on hiking and they'll maintain rates at a higher level for longer, that then benefits JP Morgan. She's also saying that you'll get a return of the IBD fee generation that had such a shocking year in 2022. And if the economy soft lands and we start to get an uptick, then you see a return to those IBD revenues, which would benefit the Goldman's of this world, but definitely would also benefit JP Morgan. So they could be strolling into like, like the perfect scenario where all divisions are firing, um, perhaps later this year and maybe into 2014, which is why I think Grasek is so bullish um, on, on JP Morgan stock. Yeah, I think the other element with JP that makes it quite interesting, medium term, so let's say the coming years, is also their investment in technology. Because I remember, I think it was last year that they said that they were going to I can't remember the timeline of the investment, but they were going to invest about $12 billion in a broad range of technologies simultaneously. Um, and I know that their team of technologists is like, they're aiming, I think, for 50,000, which is wow. larger than most other banks' total <laughs> headcount. I mean, I guess that's one of the big risks for these big, giant incumbent banks um, is their legacy tech. Mm. And you get these new challenger banks coming along, uh, like banks like Starling or um, Revolut and all these kind of players that are brand new. They don't have a lessy tech stack. They're just coming at it with brand new tech, building it from scratch. Um, and you get these super slick apps um, that are really intuitive to use and you know, are fit for purpose for the modern age, right? But these big banks, they're, they're trying, to, trying to get their old tech stack and trying to revolutionize it and make it new and shiny and pretty is a mammoth task and is costing huge amounts of money. And of course, the longer it takes them to do it, well, the more market share they, they lose to these new up, upcomers. And so, yeah, they got to go big investment side. Um, you know, they are the giants like the JP Morgans. They're not going to get washed away by this new wave of of kind of challenger banks but um yeah, I, I guess strategically they approach this it's a two-pronged attack there's build out your headcount in you know, your development team and then also get quite aggressive on your acquisition strategy right so at the end of last year they acquired a payments startup called renovite which is basically a rival of stripe and block yeah. And then that was the latest in a string of fintech deals that they'd been doing. I think they acquired um, five fintech startups as well, just as soon as the pandemic hit, they were straight on it. So I guess having the ammunition to be able to fire right. as well is another benefit that someone like Goldman's might not have with that variability. Because I was just looking the revenue of Goldman's this last quarter reported 10.6 billion when you actually put in the operating expenses, everything else, you actually just at the end, you're left with, well, I say just left with, you're left with 1.3 billion US dollars from 11 billion revenue with JP, 34 and a half going in, 11 as net income right. billion at the end of it. Yeah. So 10, 10x the net income that Goldman's have. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, obviously a big war chest mm. 
to put to work. Yeah, I mean, you, you always get the big boys having the competitive advantage. Um, I'm surprised the regulator. I mean, this is another thing, right? Obviously, the regulator, I don't know if you go down this rabbit hole, but the regulator is so obsessed with big tech and trying to break up big tech and trying to stop big tech. Um, and yet you have these other giant industries and they just don't care. And you get the JP Morgan's hoovering up, you know, all these acquisitions and, you know, solidifying their sort of market dominance. And, well, yeah, how, how are these politicians going to be able to trade if they sever those relationships? Please? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, let, let's pivot and talk a little bit about the macro scene just for five or 10 minutes. Um, starting off with the economic data points that we had, and I guess that kind of combines with the minutes, because US, there was a second reading of fourth quarter GDP earlier in the week, and it was previously estimated at 2.9%. The advanced reading got downgraded, if you like, to 27 However, the Fed's preferred inflation figure, PCE, was revised up. So you've got slightly more aggressive slowdown with a slightly more concerning inflation situation. And that does kind of feed into the summary of what the Fed was saying, right? Which was kind of, we're downshifting in rates, but the concern over inflation remains high. Yeah. I think it's been uh, like broadly, obviously January and the start of February were just rip roaring weeks for markets right and just bounced like way faster than almost everyone was expecting and that was all off the idea that the fed are gonna stop hiking now might they might do one more quarter point hike and then that's it and then we may well see a recession a mild one towards the second half of the year which means we'll get some rate cuts but What's happened in the last couple of weeks is now a kind of uh, a bit of a flip of all that argument where we're now feeling a little bit nervous because the data that's been coming in has been uber strong. So the US economy is actually firing, right? We had a really strong non-farm payrolls report for the month of January, a few weeks back now, but that was like stellar, massive, um, huge surprise. Then we've had some really strong, you know, PMI data. We had a crazy strong retail sales number out of the US. And it's like, what? What is going on here? How is this economy staying solid in the face of this massive interest rate hiking onslaught from the Fed? And, 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 you know, I think it surprised everyone, right? We were expecting the economy to turn and that feed into all that narrative about the Fed stopping their hikes, but it hasn't turned. And yeah, in the minutes, I mean, the minutes, I would say the Fed minutes. So just for those who don't know, the Fed have a meeting every six weeks, but then three weeks after each meeting, they release the, the minutes from that meeting. It just gives you much more detail as to what was discussed and what the members were thinking. Like, for example, here's a quote from the minutes that kind of was picked out um, that's led to some of this market downside. It, the quote is, the participants favoring a 50 basis point increase. So remember, last meeting, they hiked by 25 basis points. It was a unanimous decision, but some had wanted a, a bigger 50 point hike, right? And those that wanted that, um, they noted that a larger increase would more quickly bring the target range close to the levels they believed would achieve a sufficiently restrictive stance. Um, so this was kind of picked out by the media. And so, yeah, it's now playing it. But those minutes are a bit, you've got to realize those, those minutes are from the meeting in January, which was before all of this strong data. Mm. So if you now add in all the strong data, and there's already some people on that committee who wanted 50. And when they meet next time in three weeks to come, if we continue to get strong data, then I do think that you will see a slightly different Fed than we saw back in January. The Fed were very dovish in January, and I think they're probably going to have to reverse that to an extent at yeah, their next meeting. And that's what markets are reacting to now. That's why you've seen some pretty decent downside um, in, in a lot of these 
markets, like for example, you know, if you want to just pick the S and P, um, you know, we've dropped from four thousand two hundred back to below four thousand now. Um, so that's a, that's more than a five percent drop just over the last couple of weeks as we've been getting all this super strong data coming in. Yeah, and I can see that the market pricing at the moment is seventy six percent in short term interest rate futures, indicative of that meeting in three weeks of a move of 25, 20, right. So 75, 25, 25 percent still looking for fifty. And that, I assume that's gone up. Then. The, the yes. likelihood of a 50 hike has increased over the last couple of weeks. Yeah. It was like north of 90% not that long ago. before For that. 25. Yeah. For 25. Yeah. The one person then that's feeling a little bit better, I guess, is our, is our buddy Mike Wilson <laughs> at MS, the Uber bear. Yeah. yeah. Um, but just to you know, kind of stoke the flame a little bit further, he came out with his... Um, his report called the death zone. <laughs> <laughs> and he was talking about basically um, a measurement. So equity risk premium. And he was looking at that. And basically on that measurement, he's saying that the S&P 500 has fallen into the death zone, which means <laughs> then in that scenario, the S&P could slide a further 26% from its current levels. 26%. Which would be talking, well, we'd be talking uh, 3,000. Wow. We're at, yeah. just, we've just gone through 4,000 at the moment. Uh, obviously, that would be his worst case scenario. <clears throat> uh, he was basically talking about, again, same things really as, as you were there, which was recent data suggests the economy might be able to dodge a recession. Uh, they've also taken the possibility of a Fed Reserve pivot off the table. And yeah. So therefore, that doesn't bode well for stocks, as the sharp rally this year has left them the most expensive they've been since 2007 by the measure of their equity risk premium. Yeah, I love it. You know, it's so. If you were kind of stumbled across this podcast and you you knew nothing about markets, <laughs> yeah. and then you hear that you go, "Hang on, the economy is going to avoid recession, and therefore stock markets are going to collapse." <laughs> it's like, what? Hang on, no, you. You've obviously said that wrong, but it's not wrong. That's exactly the case. Mm. Good news is bad news. The better the economic data, the worse news it is for share prices um, because there won't be the Fed pivot. And yeah, it's just quite, um, it's just quite, it's a funny old world, isn't it? And quite an important point to understand the behavioral side mm. um, of how markets go about their business. But yeah, and a good point to conclude then is that markets, uh, again, if you are new to, to the game, the markets are forward-looking. And so, yeah, trying to just deal with this changing of situation over the last... It's been a really interesting couple of weeks, actually. We've really shifted through through the first two months of this this year. Yeah. Quite a significant sea change is, is underway at the moment. So we'll see. Um, it'd be interesting to see where um, the S&P closes today because we're right down at what was the low point of yesterday's in sight at the moment. So whether we close above or below there will be quite telling. Yeah, and it's quite. there's actually a really important trend line on the S&P that goes back to the October low. Mm. And it takes in the October low, then the sort of December, January low, and now where we are now is kind of the third test of this trend line. So technically really important around this 4,000 handle and yeah, where we might close, where we might close at the week um, could be pretty significant. And, you know, and as ever, we're data dependent, you know, that the Fed say that, but also markets are as well. And I tell you what, if this US data continues to come through strong, then yeah, this market's going down. Okay. Well, look, while you're in New York, then if you see Mike, just buy him a beer and cheer him up a little bit. Tell him to stop being so doom and gloom. I'm not sure that's possible. <laughs> All right, cool. We'll end it there. Thanks very much, Piers. Enjoy your time uh, in the Big Apple and I'll see we'll you next week. Yep. Cheers. See you. Take care.